Okay, everybody, we're beginning our next class now as we continue the course on uh, recapturing the Capuchin charism. And uh, last class, we were t- talking about our uh, holy poverty, you know, Lady Poverty, our no- most noble bride. I'm going to continue on this theme of poverty, talking about detachment, but also um, the end goal of poverty, the end goal of humility and discussing how we need to embrace the same bride as St. Francis did and our early Capuchins. What we want to really do is um, not just create poverty be some, to be some ideal out there, something spiritual, you know, kind of idealize it and so forth, but to talk about it being more concrete. And how do we really and truly do what the Second Vatican Council said? And that is to take the, primi- the principles of the primitive life, and bring them into today's reality. You know, how do we shake off all those things we collected over the years to free ourselves to embrace um, what our forefathers, St. Francis and our early Capuchins, embraced? Um, Over the past hundred years, we really have adopted a monastic form of poverty, which is unfamiliar to Capuchin Franciscan life. Uh, The same way that we've adopted a, uh, you know, Jesuit form of apostolate. The apostles said that the primary and uh, prayer is secondary to it. We need to return to the Capuchin Franciscan understanding of prayer where that was primary and not uh, the apostle being primary. So we're looking at poverty here and its importance in our life and recapturing that beautiful ideal in the way that the Second Vatican Council envisioned that return to the primitive inspiration of the founder. Primitive inspiration. It doesn't just mean a primitive idea or a primitive, you know, spirituality. It's the ruggedness of the truth of what it was and re-embracing it. So it's important for us to consider the ends of poverty, detachment, and humility. Our Capuchin forefathers considered contemplation to be the greatest ends of poverty and detachment. Contemplation, prayer was considered to be the greatest ends of poverty and detachment. Now, Matteo de Bascio, we mentioned him once before, he is the um, initiator of the Capuchin Reform. He said, Clearly our father, St. Francis, was enlightened by God to realize that it is not possible to apply oneself totally to the exercise of perfect contemplation without a true foundation in poverty. Read that again. Clearly, our father, St. Francis, was enlightened by God to realize that it is not possible to apply oneself totally to the exercise of perfect contemplation without a true foundation in poverty. Bernardino Basti, who spent up to six hours a day pondering scriptures, believed that the reason why St. Francis wrote the rule the way he did was so that we may be given wholly to prayer and contemplation. That the ultimate goal of poverty is contemplation. Because poverty increases our trust in God. Poverty increases our trust in God. When we begin to store up provisions or make preparations for the future, what are we saying to God? I don't trust you. I got this. You know, you don't need to provide for that. I did it all myself, right? To store up more than necessity is a grave act of distrust in God's providence. Look at the birds of the air that don't reap or sow, but your heavenly Father feeds them, our Lord told us. You know, whatever you ask the Father of my name, he will give you, our Lord told us. Do not store up treasures for yourselves, our Lord told us. The Lord told us to remain completely dependent upon Him for our daily sustenance. Give us this day our daily bread. Most holy poverty allows us the freedom to live the Our Father prayer of that trust to divine providence. The rule of St. Francis and our Constitution stop, strip us to the bare necessities so that we might remain dependent. Our clothing, our food, our shelter, the things we use being few, poor, necessary, coarse. The ultimate message, the Father loves you. The Father loves you. 
the ultimate message of poverty. The vow of poverty is the ultimate expression of the truthfulness of God's enduring love for sinful humanity. God is trustworthy. God will provide. God cares. Every head on your head is counted, our Lord said. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing it, and you're worth more than a whole flock of sparrows. So in our poverty, we're saying to the Lord, yes, I know you love me. Yes, I know I can trust you. Yes, you won't allow me to go without. No, I don't need to store up for myself. Because you care about me, Lord, and you will provide. Poverty is, as we have already said, one with humility. By remaining poor, I remain dependent upon God. It calls for childlike confidence. A child is vulnerable, able to, not able to fend for himself. A child is trusting that the parents will provide. When we finally admit that we, are too, that, we are, that we too are vulnerable, unable to fend for ourselves, and need to trust God, then and only then can we take that first step towards humility. What did Jesus say? Unless you turn and become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Men, in our pride and arrogance, don't like to ask for anything. We always have to have it under control, right? Why else do men have such a bad reputation for not asking directions when we're lost, right? We don't like to ask. So men always want to provide. I guess it's that uh, hunter-gatherer instinct. You know, we don't feel fulfilled if someone else is providing for us. The vow of poverty humbles us. It makes us ask. It makes us dependent. It opens the door for us to be childlike, allowing ourselves to once again rest in the Father's care for us. Sometimes it can be very hard to beg. Begging doesn't come easily. It can be uncomfortable it can easily wound our pride, and it can be quite embarrassing sometimes to have to go and to ask, to beg for things we need. Yet it is, it is our arrogance that gets in the way of the gospel command to be childlike, not to store up treasures, not to trust Heavenly Father. It's arrogance that gets in the way. There is not one beatitude that arrogance and pride do not disrupt or even destroy within us. Austerity and poverty are the true assistance to humility. True poverty will lead to poverty of spirit, humility. Our Capish and forefathers knew this, and so they may have fled from the world, but they fled to poverty. They fled to perfect dependence upon the Father and His love for us. So let's take a moment to reflect upon attitudes, behaviors, and patterns that have led Franciscans even reformers, away from most high exalted lady poverty. Three things here, convenience, comfort, and apostolate. Convenience is a very destructive tool against poverty. Phrases such as, you know what would make this easier? You know what we need? Wouldn't it be better if... Hear the words of convenience, convenience that begins to tear away the fabric of our living independence and poverty, tearing away from the fabric of austerity. Comfort. I don't want to offer it up. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Give me comfort. Ease my discomfort. Make it feel good. Right? These are the things that, that, that attitude, that behavior, that interior disposition that begins to eat away at our poverty through comfort. Uh, this is not a friar looking to eat the sins of the people, but it wants to live off the hard labors of others, right? St. Francis, you know, he, he didn't like the ant because it never, never took the day off, always working, always working. And he didn't like flies because flies never worked. They just ate off everybody else's labor. Brother Fly, he would call brothers who like to live in comfort because they like to live off the labors of others. The third is the apostolate. The third uh, thing that begins to corrode the life of poverty is the apostolate. We can do things faster, better, more effectively if we have this or that tool. They're not always beneficial, even though they're faster, better, or quotingly, 
quote unquote, more efficient. Especially if our charism is to take our time with people and things. Sometimes the conveniences of better things can take us away from actually being present to the people we're with. Relaxation of the perpetual gift of our will is often a cause for the loss of poverty. A relaxation of the perpetual gift of our will in the, vow, in the perpetual vow of obedience is often a cause for the loss of poverty. I want what I want, the way I want it, how I want it, in the manner I want it, when I want it. This disposition that is there, sometimes hidden underneath, sometimes in the subconscious, begins to surface and becomes destructive to our personal living out of that vow, of being faithful to that bride poverty that we have vowed ourselves uh, to embrace. It's a way of which we start becoming unfaithful to lady poverty and moving away from humility. Notice what I want, the way I want, how I want the manner I want, when I want, right? This is not a person who has entered the true spirit of poverty. The will is still set on the I, self-centered, selfish. Impatience, anger, discomfort, agitation with others will be sure signs of this type of will. The person is never content because it can never be satisfied until all bow down to serve them. That type of arrogance, that type of attitude, that type of disposition is contrary to the beautiful holy vow of poverty, which has its uh, beautiful gift of humility as part of it. The exterior poverty will be wanting in that type of attitude because the friar who gives himself to this attitude will always be seeking himself and his comforts. The will must be given in holy poverty or will, it will not be true poverty. Not only must I will to be poor, but I must give my own will if I wish to be truly poor. The gifting of the will is when we find true poverty in the gift of holy obedience. From, uh, there's a quote from Francesco de Gesi, which I don't have in front of me. Um, but he talks about uh, the beautiful gift of poverty is like being a prisoner. And I wish I would have brought the book with me. I apologize. I don't have that on me right now. So... Um, but Francesco de Gesi was very strong about this reality of poverty of will being the truest form of poverty. You know what else gets in there and really can begin to rot away our life of poverty, humility, and austerity is ingratitude. Gratefulness is an extraordinary gift to possess. When I am grateful, per when I'm a grateful person, I see everything as a gift. When I'm a grateful person, I see all as gift. All as a gift attitude leads to appreciation of that gift. I then value what I have and I don't seek for more. I'm satisfied with what has been given to me. When I am ungrateful, I become someone who is never really satisfied. Nothing is good enough. Nothing is sufficient. Nothing is never enough. And in gratitude, we're always seeking for the more. There is a lack of appreciation of what I have. There is always looking for what I don't have. And we wind up not valuing what has been given and who has given it. You see how poverty, when we're living in poverty, we, grit, we embrace holy poverty as something beautiful. Then everything we receive, we become grateful for and more appreciative of. Not only of what we've been given, but of who has given it. Both the human person has given it, and ultimately the divine person, God himself, who has provided it through others. And it gives us grateful hearts, holy poverty. But in gratitude, if we have an ungrateful spirit, it'll begin to rot away the beautiful gift of poverty. Another thing that rots away poverty is the lack of trust in divine providence. In the Revelation to St. Faustina, Jesus says that what hurts him most is our lack of trust. Think about what it feels like to be told by someone you love, I don't trust you. You're never given them cause not to trust you. You would give your life for them. And yet they say to you, I don't trust you. And that's hurtful. 
And that's what our Lord reveals to St. Faustina, that the most painful thing for him is when we don't trust him. We don't trust our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel call to trust is quite evident. Right? Do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I mean, treasures here on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Your heavenly Father knows your needs before you ask. It's a call to trust. It's a call to trust the Father that he will provide for us. The Franciscan vocation is a call to trust the love of the Heavenly Father. A call to trust the love of the Heavenly Father. Trust in God's providential love is our gospel proclamation. It is our gospel proclamation. The apostles were sent out without money, without sandals, without a second tunic, without a walking staff. So they could learn trust but also to proclaim trust. What good are our words if they are not backed up by a life of total trust and dependence on God for everything? We tell people to love God, to trust God, and yet we ourselves are not saying it by our life. What good are our words? Our words have to be backed up by that action of truly living that complete and total trust. And that's the beautiful witness of Francis and particularly for the 300 years of our early Capuchin friars. Why was Israel sent out into the desert for 40 years? To learn trust. They needed to be free of self-dependence. Food, water, clothes, shelter from the heat, warmth at night, and protection from enemies. God provided all of this for 40 years. That was the lesson they needed to learn, that their Heavenly Father loved them and was going to take care of them and not to live in fear. When we lose trust in God, we lose our poverty. God provides food. God provides shelter. God provides protection. God provides for all our needs. When we become self-sufficient, when we become independent, independent of God's providence, we lose our poverty. We lose that trust and we lose the gospel witness. This is a good opportunity to examine our own conscience and ask, am I seeking conveniences? Am I seeking comforts? Am I seeking easy ways of getting things done? Have I truly gifted my will to the Lord? Do I want what I want or do I want what God wants? Do I want what I want the way I want it? Do I want what I want when I want it? Do I want what I want in the manner I want it? Do I want what I want how I want it? Right? Or do we want what God wants for us the way God wants it for us, when God wants it for us, in the manner in which God wants it for us? Do I will to be poor? Or am I tolerating my holy poverty? Am I truly given my own will over with joy? With joy. Knowing that I'm fulfilling that Our Father prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's that old song, you know, right? Um, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Well, let God's will be done on earth and let it be done in me. Am I truly grateful? Do I see think everything in my life as a gift? How is my attitude when what is given is not to my taste? Do I remain grateful? Does the bitterness turn to sweetness because it is a gift from the Lord? It, bitterness turns to sweetness when I recognize that what I have, whether I like it or not, is a gift from the Lord and therefore it's sweet because it's got from God and therefore it's what God wants of me and for me. Do I value what I have? Am I seeking more, more than what is sufficient? Do I complain? Or do I feel content, satisfied with what God has given? Is what I have good enough, sufficient enough, enough? Or am I just wanting that more? Is there a selfishness in my heart, a greed in my heart, and even an envy that can be born from that ungratefulness? Am I ever, am I ever looking at what I don't have instead of what I do have? We ask yourself, do I really trust divine providence? When do I tend to falter in God's providence? 
What do I think God won't provide for? Why do I think God won't provide? Why do I think that? Why would I hold that thought in my head? Do I have that faith to believe that God will give what he knows I need? Am I stuck on being self-sufficient and independent? Or am I willing to become childlike again? Have I given God my will? Is my greatest poverty expressed in both the vow and virtue of obedience? Is my greatest poverty expressed in both the vow and the virtue of holy obedience? These questions are important and should be answered, but I would also ask you to make that full commitment to Lady Poverty. Like chivalrous, chivalrous knights, I can't say that word, like knights of chivalry, right? Defend her, reverence her, care for her, love her, love Lady Poverty. Like our early Capuchins of old, be wedded to Lady Poverty. Swear fidelity to her, unconditional fidelity. Defend her honor, defend her dignity, defend her virtue. Step forward. Draw your sword in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, and only for poorer, and never for richer. As true knights of Assisi, knights of the round table, as St. Francis often called, the friars. Serve Lady Poverty like our Capuchin brethren of old, with chivalry, with enthusiasm, and with love. I ask the guardians, does Lady Poverty have a place in your friary? As you walk through our friary, is Lady Poverty comfortable here? Does she find a home here? Will she stay with us? Are the friars under your charge faithful to her? Encourage them. Lead them. Stir up the flame of love for her in them. All brothers, all friars, know and discover ever more deeply the beauty of Lady Poverty and learn her dignity. Know and learn her character. St. Francis always spoke of not only of our Lord's poverty, but also of Our Lady's as well. Whenever St. Francis mentioned Our Lord's poverty, he always brought up Our Lady's poverty as well. He always reflected upon the Blessed Mother's poverty. By our marrying in vow, we should beseech Our Lady to imitate her most sublime poverty. She gave birth to the Son of God when she was homeless. She wrapped the Divine Son in poor, swaddling clothes. She laid the Divine Majesty in an animal's trough. She, a poor woman, offered two doves. She was too poor to offer the lamb when presenting Jesus. She fled as in, in exile into Egypt, as a refugee. She lived in poverty in Nazareth, the wife of a carpenter. She followed her son in his poor apostolic life. She lived with the poor early church in its mendicancy, particularly with John as he preached the gospel. She traveled with him all the way to Ephesus, living in the same poverty as the early apostles and the early church. May we realize the noble dignity of poverty professed by our Lord and Our Lady. May we, like them, live it in a manner bequeathed to us by our seraphic Father and by our great Capuchin brethren. May we pray with our seraphic Father, hands crossed, my God and my all. May God bless you and Mary keep you.